ओम ज्ञान तिमिरंधस्य ज्ञानं जनशलाकाय चक्षुरुं मिलितं येन तस्मै श्री गुरवे नमः Translation persons who are learned and who have true knowledge define sound as that which conveys the idea of an object indicates the presence of a speaker screened from our view and constitutes the subtle form of ether purport <laughs> Now I'll read that again usually I don't read it again but I will because you can listen carefully and try to absorb because it's not so easy to understand persons who are learned Hare Krishna. What's the definition of smell? Persons who are learned and who have true knowledge define sound as that which de- conveys the idea of an object, indicates the presence of a speaker screened from our view, and constitutes the subtle form of ether. Purport: It is very clear herein that as soon as we speak of hearing, there must be a speaker. Without a speaker, there is no question of hearing. Therefore the Vedic knowledge which is known as shruti or that which is received by hearing is also called apaurush apaurush means not spoken by any person materially created it is stated in the beginning of shrimad bhagavatam tene brahma hrida the sound of brahman or veda was first impregnated into the heart of brahma the original learned man adi kavaye how did he become learned whenever there is learning there must be a speaker and the process of hearing but brahma was the first created being who spoke to him since no one was there who was the spiritual master to give knowledge he was the only living creature therefore the vedic knowledge was imparted within his heart by the supreme personality of godhead who is seated within everyone as paramatma vedic knowledge is understood to be spoken by the supreme lord and therefore it is free from the defects of material understanding material understanding is defective if we hear something from a conditioned soul it is full of defects all material and mundane information is tainted by illusion error cheating and imperfection of the senses because vedic knowledge was imparted by the supreme lord who is transcendental to material creation creation it is perfect if we receive that vedic knowledge from brahma in disciplic succession then we receive perfect knowledge translation tamil every word we hear has a meaning behind it as soon as we hear the word water there is a substance water behind the word similarly as soon as we hear the word god there is a meaning to it if we receive that meaning and explanation of god from god himself then it is perfect but if we speculate about the meaning of god it is imperfect Bhagavad Gita which is the science of God is spoken by the personality of God at himself this is perfect knowledge mental speculators or so called philosophers who are researching what is actually god will never understand the nature of god the science of god has to be understood in disciplic succession from brahma who was first instructed about knowledge of god by god himself we can understand the knowledge of god by hearing bhagavad gita from a person authorized in the disciplic succession when we speak of seeing there must be form by our sense perception this the beginning experience is the sky sky is the beginning of form and from the sky other forms emanate the objects of knowledge and sense perception begin therefore from the sky the chapter is titled fundamental principles of material nature it's not very easy to understand prabhupad has given quite extensive purports to each verse if you if we consider the average length of prabhupad's purport the purports in this section are probably longer than in most sections prabhupad also spoke on this section of bhagavatam extensively over several weeks in bombay explaining these points in detail and he wanted that a book be made from the transcriptions of those lectures which eventually was done after after prabhupad's 
disappearance, I believe. Teachings of Lord Kapila came out. So Prabhupada was very interested to explain this subject. How to understand material nature from the Vedic perspective. We may think, well, it's not very interesting. Let's hear about some Leela. But this is all in relationship to Krishna. And the widely propagated misunderstanding of material nature that is ubiquitous at the present time throughout human society. Ubiquitous not means it people just take it for granted that scientific explanations are correct. That what would they call scientific? Even the way that we, we even the way we use use the word scientific refers to the modern paradigm of science. Although it's not actually, if we see the actual meaning of the word science, then modern science is not science at all. If science means to examine and understand impassively, then modern science cannot be said to be pure science. It is, there is a dogma attached to it. So these are problems in the philosophy of science, which scientists also understand that this observer is supposed to be neutral, but there's no neutral observer. Everyone has a preconditioned mindset. And in research, usually what happens is people, it's, it's a natural tendency of a human being. He has some hypothesis and he wants to prove it. So he tends to interpret the findings, even the findings may be neutrally uh, ascertained. They may be empirically ascertained, but the interpretation will tend to fit the mindset of the researcher. They'll, he will interpret it to mean what he wants it to mean. We find that everywhere. The, in every sphere of thought, the Bhagavad Gita is the same Bhagavad Gita for the Mayavadis and for the devotees. But the Mayavadis, they, they find one thing there. They find, well, they don't find Krishna. They find impersonalism, whereas the devotees find Krishna. And even there are so many, even within Vaishnavism and within Advaitavad. So uh, there are different interpretations and understandings uh, according to Kevaladvaitavad or Vishishtadvaitavad, Shuddhadvaitavad. There are different understandings. There's uh, the mystic English poet William Blake spoke on this, that we both read the Bible day and night, but where you see black, I see white. It's the same thing, but uh, different. we have a different interpretation. So if the Bible is Praman for the Christians... But still, how do you interpret it? So, the, the human element is always there. It requires someone to explain. And according to how we hear or how we absorb knowledge, that's how we tend to view the world. And we see that... All over the world there are different cultures or, and ways. And people look upon the same thing in completely different ways. Just like the, when that 9-11, the planes f 
flew into and destroyed the twin towers of the erstwhile World Trade Center and one went into the White House. So the, in much of the world this was considered not very nice and especially in America they weren't very happy about it to say the least. They thought it was a major tragedy. They saw it as terrorism. But uh, in the Arab world people thought hey, that's pretty good. So we're told. It's like the same thing. According to which country you're in, the uh, certain people will be called terrorists or according to which political faction you belong, you belong to. One section of society will be called terrorists and another one will call them freedom fighters. It's, they're do it's the same people doing the same thing, but it's a different perspective. So Prabhupada was very interested to present Bhagavad Tattva Vigyanam, knowledge of the Absolute Truth according to the Absolute Truth. The, tr the Purusham Paramam Divyam is giving the Supreme Personality of Godhead is giving knowledge about himself. As Prabhupada often pointed out, if we want to know about God, what better way than to hear from himself? And that is Bhagavad Gita. Mm. What is that? Swayam. Mm. Gita Sugita Kartavya Kimanya Shastra Vistara. Yaswayam Padmanabhasya Mukapad Bhadvinisritat. This Gita should be recited very carefully. What need is there to study in detail so many other scriptures? Because this is directly coming from the mouth of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He's so, Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita, they have the same purport. Actually, all the Vedas have the same purport. That Veda uh, Sarva Ahameva Vedya. All the Vedas, they lead toward Krishna. But at the present time, people, they do not accept Veda as Praman. They think modern science, that is the topmost Praman, so much so that people in India who are scientifically minded yet also with some inclination toward Ved, they like to show how the Vedic knowledge is in accord with modern scientific knowledge. As if to show that, well, if it fits with modern scientific knowledge, and that shows it's okay. But rather we would say if the scientific knowledge fits the Vedic knowledge, then we can accept it, otherwise not. So, this uh, particular purport, Prabhupada is actually touching on uh, a philosophical point, which has, it's an important philosophical point in both Vedic philosophy and in Western philosophy also. And it's essential to the understanding of epistemology, which for those of you, you're, most of you are not, don't have English as your first language, I don't think anyone here except me. Epistemology is that branch of philosophy which deals with praman, that how, if we're going to discuss philosophy or anything, what is, what is the basis on which we're discussing? What are the methods of acquiring knowledge? This is epistemology. So Prabhupada is pointing out here that knowledge depends upon hearing. That is the foremost means of transmitting knowledge. There are other ways also. 
the, all the senses, the Gyan Indriya, all the knowledge acquiring senses, they give knowledge, but among them, the best is the sense of hearing. Knowledge acquired by the senses is called pratyaksha, which means that which is in relationship to the eyes. And modern empiricists, their litmus test, they will say, can you show me? Unless you can show me, I won't believe it. They have great faith in the eyes. But the Vedic principle puts more emphasis on hearing. And actually, knowledge we in human society, we acquire more by hearing than by seeing. If we had to rely on seeing only, then we would all, there wouldn't be any developed science or history or geography or any such subjects. If we had to ourselves ascertain the laws of nature, then we wouldn't even be as far as Newton, what to speak of at the level of 21st century science. We believe, we, we hear, we're taught what others have discovered by hearing we acquire knowledge. And then they show, yes, we can understand that the speed of light is such and such and they'll give some, they'll give the method by which they have ascertained this. But we have to understand that by hearing. If we ourselves had to do all the, imagine it ourselves or hypothesize ourselves, then we would be bereft of all the accumulated knowledge of human society. So hearing is an essential principle. Now, hearing, if we consider it as philosophers do, it's a mystical process. Mystical means we don't really know how it works. When we, uh, this is, uh, of course, very much connected with language. We're not just talking about hearing a hammer banging, but we're talking about sound. Learning means we hear what is told. And just like, for instance, I'm going to say a word now, cow, which is called go, gavi, goru in different languages. So if we, if we say cow among people who know English, then, well, what did you think of when I said cow? You thought of a cow. In, in your mind, there came the, uh, not very specifically formed, but the idea of, an, of uh, quite a big animal with four legs and probably some horns, and a tail, and in the particular shape that is generic to cows. You didn't think of a specific cow. There are so many different breeds of cows. If, I, if we were to say a Jersey cow, then, you'd, then your thoughts would become more specific. Now, how is it that when we say cow, the idea comes into your mind at some some generic, uh, some thought of a generic cow comes into mind. There's no specific cow there, but just some general idea of cow comes into mind. That's because when we're children, we learn that certain sounds are assigned to certain objects, and in many cases, like in the, in, in almost yeah, in, in, in the case of all nouns or uh, proper nouns. Now, what's, what's the... There are abstract nouns and what's the other? Proper noun means the name of a place or person. What's the... Uh, hmm? Common noun? Hmm. 
then uh, just like we say cow or table or camera and though it if we say in a general way it doesn't refer to any specific cow or table or camera but because we have a, a general idea that's formed in our mind. So within our mind's eye, for which there's also the Sanskrit word, antadrishti, we conceive of something resembling a cow. And this, become, this becomes... So, so that I, I say cow... And you hear, and there's no cow here, but within our mind's eye, the concept of a cow is formed. And when we move to abstract nouns, and when we're talking about qualities, for instance, we're talking about humility, patience, anger. Now, apart from linguists, whose job it is to specifically define such terms we none of us specifically think what is meant by anger it's it's a it's a broad term but it's certainly different to patience for instance or beauty so even without specifically defining it we have a mental concept of what is meant by anger or beauty, or fortitude, or any of these qualities. So how these concepts can be, can be formed in each mind, and thus we are able to communicate. This is a subject of discussion. We are able to communicate by language. We are able to communicate... Uh, knowledge of this world just like we could have a class on cows now and without any cow being present here I if I knew which I don't very much knew something about cows I could communicate some things to you so without any cow being present with that with no pratyaksha we can give knowledge, or knowledge can be communicated from person to person without seeing anything, all based on the mental concept of a cow. Here's something interesting about cows. Last year I visited our pilot ISKCON farm project near Belgaum. And Madhav Prabhu, who used to be in ISKCON Sekundra about many years ago, you know him, he was telling me that the cows in that area, they eat stew. How about that? Never heard of that one before. So he never takes milk from the local village. The local village cows in that area, they eat human stew. Maybe it's a cross between a cow and a pig. I don't know. That's what they... That's what the uh, fanatic Desi Gai Wale say. That the foreign cows, because they don't have this hump on the back, they say it's a cross between a cow and a pig, which I doubt. But it seems to me they're fanaticism. Because in Shastra, there's certain symptoms of a cow, and one of them is it should have that hump on the back, which Western breeds don't have. So, anyway, there's an example. We just communicated something about cows. There's no cow here, but you learn something about cows. Not a very nice thing. Today's a bad day for goats. And a good day for goat eaters. It being, what's it called? Bakri, Bakri Eid day for cutting the bakris. Poor cows, poor goats. So, uh, how 
language, even even subtle concepts are communicated from one person to another just by sound. And even very subtle fe subtle feelings can be communicated. Poetry is the art of expressing feelings. Poetry, prose writing is more about expressing facts, even if it's imagined facts, like in a novel. But poetry is the, it's the, the main purpose of poetry is to express feelings, which are very subtle. But that is the art of a poet, that by making sounds, and even those sounds, they're not even manifest in, as sound, but they're manifest in writing. So that is communicated from one person to another. Now, here's a, here, here's a whole huge area of philosophy, and I only touched the surface of it. But there's a, there's a whole school in modern philosophy, that means it's come up since about the 1950s, What's that called in which they interpret uh, deconstructionism? Came from France. Where else? The land of Sartre and all these crazy philosophers. De where they, their idea is that you take a written, any writing, can be poetry, prose, whatever, and you deconstruct it. That means you take up apart the sentences and you assign to it the meaning that you, that appeals to you. I mean, I'm only very basically stating this. There, there are different schools of deconstructionism. But the thing is that they do so without any reference to what the writer intended to convey, which is nonsense. <laughs> because the, right, the writer wrote for a specific person, purpose to convey something in particular, but according to deconstructionism, you just assign some completely different meaning. Then what's, that was Prabhupada's complaint about the Mayavadi interpretations of Bhagavad Gita, that if you have some philosophy, then you write your own nonsense book, but don't take Bhagavad Gita. Krishna spoke Bhagavad Gita with his own particular purpose to convey a particular message. But the Mayavadis, they're, all, they're the original deconstructionists because they... They want to uh, say that, well, Krishna said this, but actually it's something else. Then why bother with Krishna? What's his authority? If you have something better to say, then write your own book. It is not to Krishna, that, not to the person Krishna that we should surrender, that, but to the unborn impersonal within Krishna. But Krishna didn't say that. And even the, the Dr. R.K. philosopher who said this, he himself admits that Krishna didn't say this. He says, isn't, because Krishna says, surrender unto me, and he says, not to the person Krishna. So he admits that it's not what Krishna says, that he's giving his own interpretation. But they, they, say, uh, they say that scripture is up to your own interpretation. And they, sometimes people ask, that uh, they, they talk like this. They said, well, I, I didn't read this interpretation of Bhagavad Gita, but I read Chinmai's interpretation and this... Chaitanya, what's his name? Sunda Chaitanya's interpretation. Makaranda, what is it? Gita Makarandam. It's all his rascal interpretation. I don't know, I don't read Telugu, but I'm sure it's rascal, even without reading it. So, they, they presume that Shastra is something which you just take it and you interpret it and you you apply your intelligence in your own way and whatever comes up in your mind, that is it. That is the truth. So, I, I remember myself, I was so glad when I got Prabhupada's books. That, oh, whew, at last, someone just straightforward, not this going round and round in circles, dreamy, 
this all vague terms which no one can, which don't really mean anything the divine luster emerge into you know, what, what does it all mean and talking all these vague talking about beauty and truth but nothing nothing you can get a hold of nothing practical and Prabhupada comes and says Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead we all have to surrender to Krishna oh, at last but the Mayavadis will say oh that's just a very low platform you come, you come to the higher platform where everything is vague and unclear and wishy-washy and it's all just dreamy. But then why? Why bother with Shastra at all? Shastra has a specific message. Then why, uh, if you're going to interpret it this way, that way, then why, uh, why bother with Shastra at all? Then you just say your own thing. This is what Prabhupada who pointed this out. In his, in, in his introduction to Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada writes that one should at least theoretically, if one is going to read this, say, accept Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Because if Krishna is not an authority, then why bother with Bhagavad Gita anyway? If you think it's just a book, that you can, inter it's just a book among so many other books, then why bother? Just like when Prabhupada was first lecturing at 26 Second Avenue, someone asked him, he was lecturing on Bhagavad Gita, and someone said, well, maybe uh, next week you're going to speak on the Tibetan Book of the Dead, as if you can take this book or that book. Or, that was the hippie, uh, eclectic, neo-Mayavad idea that well, you read a little bit from the Bhagavad Gita and you read a little bit from the Tibetan Book of the Dead and you re read something from Alan Watts about Zen Buddhism then you read something from William Blake I mentioned before, he's some mystic English poet and then you, you take some LSD and then you have some realization <laughs> and this is called spiritual life So here we are at the beginning. How do we begin to understand? What are the fundamental principles? This chapter is entitled Fundamental Principles of Material Nature. And people want to understand what is the spiritual nature. They want to jump up. But we cannot understand what is the spiritual nature without first understanding what is, the relate, what is the difference between material and spiritual and what is the relationship between material and spiritual. Because at the present time we identify with the material and without clearly understanding the difference between material and spiritual, if we all talk about spiritual life, then we'll just, we will impose on the understanding of spiritual life our materialistic understandings. That's why, the, 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 I, personally, I feel this all this interfaith and it's mostly all just a complete waste of time or worse. Because people are going, they talk about God, God, spiritualism and this and that, but when they say God, what do they mean? When they, ta they talk about spiritualism, what do they mean? First of all, we should define and understand. We can talk about God with someone, but then if he goes home and... Uh, he, eats some beefsteak or whatever, then wh wh where is his understanding of God? He's not qualified to speak. Or if you think that mostly they say God is undefinable, they don't want to define him because if he's defined, then you have to surrender to him. So they prefer he remains undefinable. And they're talking about God, but then uh, who is who is that person? People are talking as if they know something, but they haven't even asked the right questions to get the right kind of knowledge. King Tam Brahma, Kim Adhyatma, King Karma Purusha Uttama. These kind of questions Arjun was asking. 
to understand what is material, what is spiritual, what is the relationship, how to understand this. We say by hearing, here's by, by that, what kind of hearing? And then the hearer has to be in contact with that transcendental sound. Then you may say, well, it, it's only some vibration on our ear drum. And we go inside the ear, there's some fluid inside the ear plus some space. And, and if you look at the ear, it doesn't look very spiritual. It's pretty grotesque, actually. So how can the ear be the medium for conveying that which is spiritual? That's why these, these so-called spiritualists, they say, well, it's all feeling. You just have to feel it. And when they say, when you corner them philosophically, they just say, words, it's all words. Words have no meaning. They'll go on talking nonsense, but then when you point out they're talking nonsense, they say, well, ultimately it has no meaning, which means that they admit that it's nonsense. But they want to say that what you are saying is nonsense, but we say no. That the sounds that are coming through parampara, that is a transcendental sound. How, what does that mean? The transcendental sound, what, what reaction can that have with the, with the eardrum, which is formed of matter? So all these questions have to be addressed. This Parikshit Maharaj, he asked this question. That became the basis of the, prayer, of the recitation of the prayers of the personified Vedas. That the, the transcendental sound coming from the transcendental person can be made available, accessible to the, even to the conditioned soul if he is favored by the mercy of the Supreme Person. Then that, trans that transcendental sound transcending the conditions of mundane ether, mundane eardrum and mundane conceptions can Penetrate, vidyate hridya grantis, chidyante sarva sangshayaha, can penetrate the material coverings and awaken the soul who is the person who is to hear the transcendental sound. So these are great topics. Actually, great topics means vast topics. This epistemology, we, we would think that's the beginning of philosophy, to ascertain how we can attain knowledge. But even to discuss epistemology, we have to already, we already have to accept some axioms. If we're going to discuss how to attain knowledge, well, first of all, what, what are the parameters of knowledge? then even to discuss that, we have to a priori accept knowledge. That If we're going to discuss how we can ascertain knowledge, then even by discussing, we are accepting that the process of discussion is valid. And that by expressing various theories that we, we have accepted the, the, the linguistic process. And when we say, you know, even when we say knowledge, how to attain knowledge, there may be a difference of opinion of what knowledge is, even when we're discussing about how to attain it. But there is, even two people who have two different completely different theorems of the nature of reality, when they're discussing how we can attain knowledge, both of them, by using the word knowledge, they, they both, even they have a difference of opinion of what is the nature of that knowledge, but what is the basic understanding of what knowledge is, they both have that. Otherwise, you can't begin to discuss anything. So actually, epistemology is not the first subject. To discuss anything... There must be some basic axioms accepted. So, and ultimately epistemology, it, it comes down at some point to faith. 
Faith must be there. If, first of all, we have to have faith that there is knowledge, there is something worth knowing. And then there are some philosophers who say, well, there's nothing worth knowing, there's nothing, nothing, that's it. <laughs> nothing worth knowing, nothing not worth knowing, just nothing, shunyavad. But even to say nothing, you have to have a concept of something to think of nothing. You just can't think of nothing, it's not possible. And they try to evoke thoughts of nothingness by giving the idea of the sound of one hand clapping. And you're trying to... one hand. It doesn't work. So, of course, you could clap it against someone's head. It's possible. So they, they try to evoke consciousness of nothingness. And in fact, they, in Shunyavad, or Buddhism, or Jainism, they have elaborate philosophies describing the nature of nothingness. And there are different theories of nothingness, so they argue among themselves over the nature of nothingness. But in the end, it all comes to nothing. <laughs> so, Shankaracharya, he gave... There is something. But Shankaracharya's idea of something wasn't very different to nothing. It was nothing with a name, that's all. No form, no, no sound. No direction, no feelings, no interaction, but it has a name, Brahma. Oh. That's all. And even then, but the, but even the Buddhists and the uh, any any system of philosophy, they have to have their epistemology. Which the Vedic system is that the ultimate praman is Veda, Shabda, hearing. But that's also, Pratyaksha is also needed. It's not that prati, we say Pratyaksha is defective and Anuman is defective. But without Anuman, one cannot even, the, the Vedic message, without Pratyaksha and Anuman, one cannot begin to understand it. Just like it's, it's stated in Shastra, that Krishna holds a flute. So if you never saw a flute, you'd have no idea what's being talked about. Or if we, if we Anuman means hypothesis. So if we say that Krishna has, or, or the Krishna's Bahiranga Shakti is an expansion of his Antaranga Shakti. So we're, we're dealing, we're talking about subtle matters, which is not to be seen. But it's, when we say an expansion, one energy is an expansion of another. So we can, we can conceptualize this in our minds. That's by the process of Anuman. So Pratyaksha and Anuman are not bad in themselves. They're, they're essential, but they should be guided by Shabda Praman. In and of themselves, they are defective. But when guided by Shabda Praman, then they become the uh, means to understand that. Of course, that in itself would be a disputed point. But the point here we're talking about, uh, what are the, the methods of understanding? It begins with sound. So Prabhupada wanted to discuss all these things in great detail so we can understand very clearly all these different points so we should do so even if we speak so many points about Krishna Leela we should also speak we should hear but if we if we speak about Krishna Leela without understanding these points what is the difference between spirit and matter then we'll think Krishna Leela is some kind of material 
nice stories, that's all. And such speaking is popular. People like it because it entertains them. But it may not help them very much unless they have a clear understanding of what is the difference between spirit and matter. Any questions? Have they... Yeah, use this mic. Arish, there is argument that everything is... Speak into the mic so the sounds amplified. Yeah. Uh, everything is within the mind, these conceptions. The eyes, they give information to the brain and within the brain it is manipulated. Okay. And what we hear, okay, it that's is within good. the then brain. Then we don't need to feed you anymore. You can eat mental cheese. You can eat mental chapatis. If everything's in the mind... All right. So now we don't, you know, you don't need to feed you anymore. It's all just in the mind. You didn't understand. Okay. Let him fast for a few days, then he'll understand. <laughs> it will be varying per person to person. The, hmm? inform the information may be varying to person to person according to his condition of mind. The information what I get and what I feel may be different. And no, it that I discussed in the class that the... The information is the same, but the processing is different. What I see and what you see, of course we can't prove that, but we presume by the interaction, by the way we interact, that we see the same thing. Just like, like if I ask you, go and ring that bell, and then you walk over and you ring it. That means that when I say bell, and you you understand the same thing. And when I say ring, you understand the same thing. So it's the same, we can presume that from this that it's this, people receive the same information but they process it differently according to their different mindsets. I, I discussed that in the class, that point already. Hare Krishna. This class is finished and you can all go and take prasadam, but not you. You can, you can think about it. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai. Hare Krishna.